I think while we're just um, queuing up for the next session in terms of the our arrangement of audiovisual, here we go, which is great. I'm ready with our, our film, I think. I'd just like to uh, introduce a very special guest that we have this evening, Paul Griffiths. Paul, would you like to come and join us? So we'd, when we started thinking about trade, Dubai Airport was a very obvious choice. It's obviously changed everything in this city and is absolutely central to the notion of trade in Dubai in terms of goods, people, and the way we think about our city. But we were also very interested in this idea of the trade between, uh, between music and musical motifs. And we've also had quite a few preliminary conversations about the polydexterity, if you like, the way in which uh, playing an organ takes two hands or maybe five hands and definitely two feet and maybe more feet, and I think you'll see in a minute that come to life. And the idea of kind of conducting an airport, an airport being a place that almost has a score of its own and runs in a very particular way. Um, it was fascinating to hear Lale talk about a container ship as being a world in its own because we have had conversations about how an airport is very much that as well. And I think we'll come on to that in a moment. First of all, I wanted to ask you, I guess, Paul, a little bit about your background. I know you made a very strategic decision between becoming a musician or becoming a computer scientist. Can you wind the clock back to when you made that decision? Sure. I don't think it was actually a strategic decision. It was, um, it was actually some rather entrenched parental prejudices, actually. Um, my father, who was a jazz musician, really didn't like the precarious lifestyle. And I think, you know, I think the sort of flip-flops between the generations and I'm sure, you know, artists in the room will probably be quite sympathetic that, you know, parents sometimes don't want to encourage that artistic side because they're worried, I suppose, about keeping their kids on the payroll for the rest of their lives, you know. So uh, my father was absolutely unequivocal, you know, go and get yourself a proper job. And I feel that if I'd have given up playing the organ, given up my music and given up all my other passions, and I'd got a job as a bank clerk, then he would have been able to say to the neighbours, oh, do you know, he works for the bank. He's a good boy, that boy. But well, you, know, you um, blew those expectations slightly out of the water, didn't you? Well, I, d I did a bit. But the, the thing is, you see, I just didn't want to just have a sort of boring life in, in an office. I was just absolutely determined not to do that. And when I was growing up, um, from the age of about 10, um, I had no idea about music or anything like that. And my best friend at school, Philip Reardon, said to me, why don't you come and join the choir at church? And I said, why do I, why do I want to do that? You know, I've got no interest in it. He said, you get paid for it. So I said, when can I join? <laughs> so um, I turned up at the church and you know, went through the choir practice, which was fine. And he said at the end, why don't you come and have a look at the organ? So I sort of wandered up and there was this thing with three keyboards and masses of stops and everything and it was that it was my life's eureka moment when I just decided from that moment onwards I want to play this thing I want to master it I want to you know get behind it and actually see if I can actually become an organist and I badgered the choir master and said please teach me and he eventually did and sort of didn't really look back from that point onwards you know so I think that's our cue to play the film, maybe, because there's, yeah, there's becoming an organist and then there's becoming an organist. So maybe we can just give you a small flavour of what that actually means. Can we have a... About a year ago, I read a book by the editor of a major international newspaper who managed to find 20 minutes of his time every day to learn a major tour de force of the piano world by Chopin. I decided I wanted to do the same, so I chose a tour de force of the organ world, the suite by Maurice Duriflet, Opus 5. I'd like to play for you now his Toccata, the final movement of the three movement suite.
French organist and composer Maurice de Rufflet was born at the turn of the 20th century. He became assistant organist at Notre Dame in Paris. His compositions are very few and far between. The most famous of his works is the Requiem, written in 1947. Throughout his life, he continued to review and revise his few compositions, including his suite for organ, written in three movements. The ending of the Toccata, the most vibrant of the three movements, he revised several times and published in several different forms. He is well known as being an absolutely virtuosic perfectionist and his suite, Opus 5, certainly demonstrates the unique character of the organ in its three very contrasting movements. What I particularly love about Maurice Duraflay's suite, particularly his frenetic toccata, is the fact that it's an absolute tour de force for the coordination of eyes, ears, hands and feet. It brings all of those into an incredibly frenetic and restless piece of music, which is one of the pinnacles of the organ repertoire. especially for us. I mean, we couldn't actually bring the organ into the tent, so we thought we'd um, try and give you a flavour. Just to give a bit of background, that's been described as one of the most difficult organ pieces ever written. And the organ that, that Paul is playing there is the only concert organ that exists in, in the UAE, and that's in your, your home here in, in is, Dubai. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So <laughs> thank you for that. It raised a few eyebrows when the guys delivered it in this big box, and my heart fluttered when they pushed it perilously close to the swimming pool on its way in. I didn't know how I was going to make the call to the maker saying, I'm sorry, it's fallen in the pool. Can you, can you send me another one? Yeah. Mm. And for, for anybody that's um, in London in the summer, I think you're playing the whole thing in Westminster Abbey on August the 13th. That's absolutely right. Shameless plug, everyone. 13th of August, 5.45, if you want to hear that whole thing resonate around the lofty uh, building uh, at Westminster Abbey it will be I promise you it will be quite an experience I'm sure mm. um, I think the, the film or the, the images that we're looking at now is taking us into your day job mm -hmm. when you're not playing the organ you're running the world's uh, busiest international airport um, we've talked a little bit about you mentioned there you know that being a challenge for eyes ears hands and feet mm -hmm. and I imagine the airport is is something like that too mm -hmm. I get the fun of reeling off a few uh, statistics about the airport just to give people a little bit of um, insight, which your, uh, your colleague Lorne uh, helped me with a lot. So, I mean, just to give a little idea of what Paul is overseeing, this year in January you had 2,600, hang on, 260,000 passengers a day. Mm -hmm. uh, there are 1,100 flights a day. Mm -hmm. 9.3 million bags are processed by 140 kilometers of luggage belts. Mm -hmm. uh, if everyone can absorb all these numbers. Um, the baggage handling service floor equals 75 football fields. And here's a good one. Duty free sold 2,066 tons of chocolate in January and 2,711 kilograms of gold, which goes nicely back to Sultan's panel about the gold trade mm. indeed and 100,000 people work at the airport. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about how that works. I mean, we're looking at, at an animation at the moment uh, which 
we saw in Paul's office, which overlooks uh, departures, which shows, just to give a little flavour of how an airport is actually kind of run, these, well, why don't you tell us, what, what are we looking sure, at? Sure, okay, this is, this is actually a piece of new technology. This is live data feed showing the passenger flow through the various areas of the airport. Um, the red dots are people that are in a queue and the white dots are people that are moving. And what we can derive from this is statistics about the performance of the airport because my desire is that at the moment on this planet there's only really two places that you queue at the post office and at the airport. And what I want to do is if we're successful in turning this data into action so that we eliminate all the red dots and have only white dots of people moving, then I can go and ceremoniously hand back the monopoly on queuing to the post office so that no one ever has to queue at the airport. Because the airport is a very complex machine, a bit like the organ, and the, the idea is just keeping everything moving the statistics you've reeled off, you know, when we're processing three people a second, if something goes wrong, you know, the number of bags that can build up mounts into tens of thousands in a matter of minutes. And everyone, I'm sure, that's travelled, the worst thing that anyone ever wants to experience is a delay. So when you get, when you arrive at an airport, your immediate thoughts, I just want to grab my bag and go and be gone. And we want to facilitate that, you know, much as I'd love people to stay at the airport and spend lots of money in our shops and, <laughs> and restaurants, you know, at the end of the day, I think travellers really are, it's about the destination and we aim to make the journey the means to the end and as effortless and as enjoyable as, they, as it possibly can be. Thank you. We decided to leave this running a bit because maybe we've all been too much in the art world the last kind of couple of weeks, but it somehow resembles some kind of contemporary art yeah. animations. We thought we'd, Indeed, <laughs> we'd keep yeah. it there for a bit. By the way, that is speeded up. You don't have to be Usain Bolt to use the airport. That is actually a speeded up uh, animation. It's not, real t it's not actual real time. So in terms of your job, I mean, you're obviously looking at maps like this of the vast airport. I mean, that presumably that includes people. It includes planes. Presumably yeah. taking off, and so what? It, what kind of? I mean, well, I, I'm very fortunate that it's such a complex environment that no two days are ever the same. Um, I can go further than that and say, when I arrive in the morning and I have my day planned, by the end of the day, it never ever goes as planned. There's always something different that's happening every day, and it is like running a city because we have hospitals. You know, we, we have all sorts of different facilities for staff and customers. You know, we, we have shops, we have restaurants, we have bars, we have all sorts of different places that cater for every, you know, human need. You know, hair salons, dentists, uh, um, uh, surgeons, etc. All sorts of different things are happening. And you do have to keep everything coordinated very carefully. Because when you've got this number of people and the number of planes and movements happening, I mean, we have something like 40 aircraft arriving every hour and um, keeping the whole operation on the move is, is quite an undertaking, particularly when we've tripled the size of the airport over the last 10 years. When I arrived in 2007, the airport was handling about 32 million passengers a year. Uh, if you multiply 8 million that we experienced in January, by 12, that means something over 90 million this year, which is probably where we're going to end up. And we haven't grown the footprint of the airport. We're quite closely um, uh, covered on all sides of the perimeter of the airport, so there is no more space to build. So the infrastructure we have is the infrastructure we've got to exist with, and therefore we've got to find ways of increasing capacity through technology and processes and keeping everything moving. So things like this system do help us monitor. We should have chosen a better um, example. You can see that something's gone wrong there and the number of red dots has got to be uh, rather more voluminous than it really ought to be. So. Is this making you long to sort of press the button to say more people come and... Well, that, that's the point. You see, by creating the visibility of what the customer experience is looking like, it does create, I think, some sort of jeopardy. You know, before... When we, our colleagues in immigration, we used to say, look, you know, the queues are built up and we email them a photograph and there were all the queues there. Um, all they do is wait for a few minutes for the queues to die down 
and then they'd take a photograph and send it back saying, oh, no, it's not. We've There's nothing it. here. That's right. So this live information now is actually creating that virtuous loop. And we, we put it into all the transfer areas where people that are arriving from one destination and going on to another use that are manned by the police, and they responded admirably. The good thing, of course, is you can get this on an iPhone, and we've got a closed user group of people that can see it, including my boss, Sheikh Ahmed, and um, uh, Sheikh Hamdan and Sheikh Maktoum. They also have this on their iPhone. And when Sheikh, Sheikh Ahmed stood in a meeting and we were presenting all this technology, and I said to everyone present, it was police, customs, immigration, all our staff, I said, and of course, everyone can get this on their iPhone so they can see what's going on. And Sheikh Ahmed said, even me. And I have to say, that was the most powerful endorsement of technology that I've ever had in my career. And everyone suddenly, oh, right, OK, well, we better not mess up because we know who's watching. So it's quite incredible how what might seem like a piece of fairly simple technology representing people as dots on a screen can change the behavior and hopefully influence very positively the the outcome that you can see all the red dots have gone now which is great we only we just had to wait for a bit and then it was uh, well yes that's right but hopefully someone somewhere when that was happening exactly. saw the data reacted and got people on the desks to to sort it all out which is good I found it interesting when we caught up uh, and discussed this panel that I asked you, you know, about controlling this city. And, and you said, oh, no, no, we don't control, we, we influence. And actually so much is to do with human psychology and mm. human behaviour that comes. So your background in computer science, I mean, maybe this is where the music comes in and the more kind of left brain, right brain kind of... But can you just tell us a little bit about that and the ways in which uh, you've applied kind of say, you know, principles of psychology to human behaviour in terms of... Well, I, I think the thing is, you know, because because I love my art and music, and I've got that sort of left brain side to me, um, I've always been very interested how those two things coexist in everyone. It can't always be about process, particularly where people are involved. Because at the end of the day, you know, there might be red dots on a screen, which is a very interesting technical phenomenon. But you know, the more red dots we have, the more people's days we're spoiling. And unless you have that sensitivity to how the experience is imp impacting someone's an emo emotional state, you, know, y you can't really be passionate about finding a solution. And I, I, I've always believed that you know, the, the idea of influencing something and getting the right behavior is not just about explaining the logic and the facts, but also to make it compelling and to use different techniques to influence people. And I think everyone responds to things in a different way. And as I mentioned, you know, although there are 100,000 people on the airport, we only directly control, if you include our outsourcing partners, about four or 5,000. But we have a big dependency on police, on customs, on immigration, on the airline customers that we have, on various other people who you know, don't report directly to the airport. But if they don't perform, we have a big problem. So part of the job I really enjoy is when I go up into the, the control tower and I meet the controllers and I just sort of sit there in bewildered awe watching them conduct all this amazing, you know, geometry and poetry in the sky of bringing all these aircraft down one after the other. It's amazing and the responsibility that carries. But the thing is, you see, the influence there is not just to do their job safely, but also can they find ways to increase the flow so we can get more people on the ground quicker, that sort of thing. Because, again, delays in the air are just as annoying to people as delays um, on the ground. So the, the ability to influence people by really understanding the psychology of what makes them tick, you know, it might be presenting them with a certificate of appreciation. It, it might be just, you know, thanking them very much for something they've done. It might just be having their photograph taken with you. You know, that, that sort of thing. Different strokes for different folks. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we're also talking about the way in, in which you can influence the movement of people through that space. But also, I think what was um, 
uh, fascinating was the idea of this being a city that is a particular kind of, I think you said, a crucible of human emotion. And, mm. and the way that, I mean, people are, people are coming and going, they're departing, they're arriving, they have that sort of anxiety around that, but also kind of a, it's a city of heightened emotion. So if you just tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, I, I think the thing is, you know, I'm, I was 19 when I first flew, and I know that's quite late for a lot of people. Um, certainly today, I mean, most people fly in the womb, don't they? I mean, they're before they're even born, you know. Um, and I've, I was always struck by what an emotional experience it, it was to, you know, get on this huge, great, you know, metal bird surrounded by lots of highly explosive liquid <laughs> and then propel yourself along a runway f faster than you'd ever been on any vehicle on land and then just go into the sky. And, and it was just, I mean, I still love going to the end of the runway and watching all the A380s take off. It's just so mind-boggling that, that human endeavour has produced these sort of hundreds of tonnes of metal and carbon fibre that will transport people across the other side of the world. You know, there is that sort of romantic in me that thinks flying is really quite a cool thing to do. <laughs> and I think the thing is, for, for lots of people, it, it does affect people emotionally quite differently, especially when you think of the underlying social purpose of travel. You know, people are travelling to be reunited with their families or to meet a loved one or to be parted from someone for a long time. So there's a whole range of human emotion associated with travel. And I'm always very conscious of the fact that, you know, we we are facilitating those, you know, desperately sad moments and those desperately ha happy moments. And I go home some days hoping that we've facilitated many more happy moments than sad moments. But, you know, travel is for some people, particularly those that are unfamiliar with it, quite a stressful experience and therefore we have to create an environment which is quite reassuring for them really. I wanted to, um, I'm getting a, a wave from someone saying we've got 10 minutes left so I just wanted to turn a little bit to the future of travel mm -hmm. and future mapping. I know this is obviously something that you're very much involved with in imagining the new airports that are to come and the kinds of uh, Travelers, or the uh, the increase in travellers that are going to be that are projected there. Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about what you're foreseeing in the future and where the new travellers are coming from, and then we. Mm. Can, yeah. Sure. Well, global air travel is a very much a growth industry, and it's something that is facilitating a lot of very good things. I mean, it, I think it draws communities closer together. It does enable people to, you know things like this event, you know, would not be possible here without the explosive growth of, of affordable air travel for everyone to be able to aspire to. And it's very interesting, by 2034, there's going to be something like, um, I think it's 1.3 billion additional air passenger journeys originating from Asia alone which is a phenomenal figure when you think about that potential. 1.3 billion additional passengers Annual today. passenger journeys per year, yeah, that's right, by 2034. That's in addition to all the organic growth from all the other markets around the world. So it is very much a growth industry. And will they be coming through Dubai? Um, hopefully they will be, because we are certainly going to be building the infrastructure to cope with it, because what we want to do is continue to grow at the existing airport, and the idea is by um, 20, I think it's 20, something like 2023, be capable of accommodating 118 million, which might not sound very many more than the 90 this year, but that's about the absolute limit of the existing airport. And then on the screen now is a, is a clip of the new airport, Dubai World Central, Al Maktoum International, which is um, set to be operational by 2025 in its enlarged form with an initial capacity of about 120 million and will set to grow from there. We can then increase the size of that to 240 million, which we believe will be the throughput by about 2035, 2040, something like that. So Dubai is absolutely at the epicenter of the growth of aviation and the government is very, very supportive and sees that the growth of the city and the growth of the quality and quantum of its communications is an absolute enabler. You can't have one without the other and it's a very refreshing attitude and I have to say 
I can't imagine anywhere else on the planet that if you're involved in this business is more sort of enabled and more facilitated by the very positive attitudes that um, flow out of that thinking. By the way, I do apologise. You said no commercial slides, and I, I didn't couldn't help noticing that the man cleaning the runway is using Mr. Muscle there. So I'm sorry, we didn't have time to, we'll to paste forgive, out the we'll label. We'll that. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but just, to, I mean, the, the I mean, the increases that you're the numbers you're mentioning are kind of mind-boggling. Mm. So what's, but um, I guess some people could say the reason that, or part of the reason that Dubai has been successful in this is obviously access also to, to energy and to, but is this, I mean, is it sustainable if, if people just continue to travel more and more and will travel get, how can it get cheaper? How can it get more accessible? And is that sustainable or do we need to? That's a very good point. And the thing I do um, with my responsible citizen hat on, one thing I do worry about is the sustainability of um, air travel. And one thing where there's got to be some technological breakthrough is we have a basic problem. And that problem is that in order to be able to get a, uh, an aircraft into the air, we need to use a fuel that is both very calorifically dense, in other words, has very high energy, but is also light. So all the alternative power sources that you're now seeing for other forms of transportation is very difficult to reproduce for, for an aircraft because it has to take all its fuel with it. So the technological breakthrough that will produce a more sustainable source of energy for um, aircraft is something. Although, having said that, modern technology, modern aircraft engines are incredibly responsible and efficient in terms of their emissions and I think air travel is only about 2% of the global greenhouse emissions that are produced globally. So um, that's something that the industry is working on and must work on um, going forward. Um, but I think other than that, if we can find a solution to the fossil fuel dependency, then you know the, the efficiency of air travel and the speed of air travel is something that um, will continue to facilitate decreases in cost and increases in availability, which I think has to be a good thing. Yeah. No, yeah. well, I'm sorry to have to close the conversation because there's so much more that we could, we could talk about, but it's a real honour to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, we look forward to the next talk or the next organ recital probably next time. I'm sure I can come up with more on both subjects, that's for sure. Thank you very much for asking me. Thank you me. so much, Paul. Thank you.